Bankless Nation, welcome to the second week of February. David, what are we doing today? We are rolling up the second week of February in this weekly ups. We go through five different sections to make sure that you can stay up to date with the crazy world of crypto. We start with the markets. We talk about what's going on in the markets. What are the markets saying? Then we go into re uh, releases. What got released? Who released what products in the crypto world? Then we go into news. What happened in the news cycle? Then we finish up with some ecosystem takes. Who had interesting opinions this week? And then we finish up with what David and Ryan are excited about. And and of course, our new section, which just takes a little bit of time at the very end, which I'm in love with this new section, the meme of the week. The meme, the of, meme the week. of the week. To, it to is, finish it off. It's, it's hard to pick the meme of the week every week. And it's hard to condense all of this crypto information into a hour, 45 minute segment. How, how long does it take us these days, David? I, I don't know. We're getting it down. Oh, but we, we Depends. We initially committed to trying to get this to be 25 minutes and we gave up on that like roughly three episodes in. So now now we do this in about 45 <laughs> minutes. All right, the week the, of crypto in 45 minutes. The bull run uh, edition of rollups is going to be a <laughs> bit longer, guys, but we're going to cram this into your brains as quickly as possible. David, you ready to start? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's roll them up. Uh, the markets. Let's start with Bitcoin price. David, what is happening in Bitcoin land? Oh, you know, just a few things. Uh, Bitcoin had reached an all-time high, new all-time high of $48,000 after Elon Musk and Tesla announced that they bought $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. It's the largest single announcement of a Bitcoin purchase ever. And so not only did that, the actual purchase itself probably pumped the price, but the announcement also pumped the price. Uh, and that's that's where we are now. So now Bitcoin is consolidating between forty eight and forty five thousand dollars at the time of recording. We are at forty seven point seven thousand dollars. Really expensive Bitcoin. We're, we're flirting with 50K there. And the question is, will Bitcoin hit 50K or will ETH hit 2K sooner? Which one happens first? E Let's talk ETH price, David. What's ETH doing this week? ETH also following Bitcoin's footsteps, breaking its all-time high, a new all-time high set of $1,840. At the time of recording, we are at $1,795. Uh, Ether still kind of doing its, its kind of slow breakout on, on a pause uh, because when Bitcoin rampages, everything else takes a pause. Um, but it, after Bitcoin kind of capped out at $48,000, we, uh, we saw the DeFi tokens start to like really start to try and climb out of that pause that they took. Uh, DeFi tokens don't move when Bitcoin does move, but like they are ready to go. It seems like they're ready to go. Uh, and that's kind of where I have my eyes on right now. We passed some really interesting metrics too. Here, here's one on Ethereum. More than a trillion transactions on Ethereum. That's trillion with a T since mm -hmm. its inception. Pretty incredible, David. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this is a pretty cool landmark to, to, to pass. I wasn't, I don't personally count the number of transactions. I kind of <laughs> never really realized that this was a metric, but you know, 1 trillion was 1 trillion, 1 trillion transactions on Ethereum. That's pretty cool. Yeah, big number. Uh, all right, let's talk about DeFi for a second. Start us off with total locked value. Where are we this week? Yeah, we are above 40 billion locked in DeFi. Ryan, was it it was under a year ago that we like passed 1 billion in DeFi or we must be coming around the 1 year anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Now we're at 40 billion and like these landmarks are just like flying by us. Uh 50 billion dollars is in the sights. I guess uh 100 billion, maybe we stop to appreciate that a bit more. I guess that's yeah. the next milestone and then what? A trillion? Are we going to hit a trillion this market cycle? I mean TBD, right? I think we could hit a trillion this market cycle. A trillion dollars locked in DeFi this market cycle. I think it's totally happening. Let's talk DeFi, about the DeFi Pulse Index too, David. What, what What's that hitting this week? $451. Again, an all-time high. All-time highs across the board. You know, just everything. Everything is up and to the right. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, and of course, I'm also always paying to... DPI slash ETH. That is my DeFi season indicator. And again, it continues to march upwards in this slow motion trend. De you know, formerly known as alt season, now known as DeFi season is typically characterized by like really violent upwards moves. And we aren't seeing those violent upward moves, but we are seeing slow motion upwards moves. And uh, the DPI is outperforming Ether slowly but surely every single week. It's a little bit higher. Uh, and this week is no different. We've got some numbers by sector this time that is interesting. We don't always cover in the market section, but I think we should this time because there is now 1 billion assets under management in these, thing, these things called DAOs, decentralized autonomous 
organizations. How important is that? And what are DAOs, David? Yeah, DAOs don't have a completely defined uh, de uh, definition, but basically it's like a protocol on Ethereum that has a treasury that it manages, right? So Uniswap has a uni, uni token treasury, uh, Wiren has a treasury, uh, Yams have a treasury, all these protocols have treasuries. Uh, and uh, Deep DAO, this Twitter account, is reporting that there is over $1 billion of value in DAOs. Uh, and so that's $1 billion worth of funding for these DAOs to get done what they want to get done. Done, right? This is capital yet to be deployed. If you're interested in working in this space, you should be looking at that $1 billion treasury mark from all these different DAOs as potential income for you, the worker. If you can provide value to some of these DAOs, they will pay you. That's what it's for. Yeah. it's And I wonder if this stat is actually underreporting because I know for a fact, like there are, there are some um, protocols like Uniswap, for instance, mm -hmm. who have maybe billions in their treasury. Wow, like really? um, it, could be. it could be lots in their treasury right. for, from the unit token. So I wonder if this is underreporting at some level, but what's, what's interesting back to is, what I was saying about the, the looseness of the definition of what exactly. it is. There's subject, subjectivity, uh, subjectivity and inclusion here. But what these things are is they're basically capital pools, aren't they? So, you know, one of the most common capital pools in the traditional world is the company, the corporation. And it, of course, keeps its assets in bank accounts, in various, you know, uh, dollars or currencies or bonds or this sort of thing. This is just that. It's capital coordination, only it's happening on chain in these token vote DAO type structures. It's almost like it's almost like the modern corporation in this uh, DeFi landscape, which is super exciting to see it hit that 1 billion mark. Let's talk about another sector, David. This is crypto art sales. Crypto art sales on Ethereum have reached a record $80 million. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that, that's pretty insane. Uh, NFT sales are up into the right. Uh, and this uh, $80 million, I mean, comparison to DeFi, it's actually kind of a small number. But with NFTs, NFTs is like this massively growing industry. There's another link, uh, cryptoart.io slash data that has some nice bar charts. If you want to look at NFT uh, data over time, uh, and, and this is transactional data. This is like volume of NFT sales. Uh, and it's also heavily up and to the right. Uh, type in slash or, or hit that data button, uh, Ryan, right there. Um, and you, you'll see the massive uh, bar that was last week's, uh, what was it, the hash, hash max, masks activity, lots of volume there. Um, and so, so that's a little bit of an outlier right there. But uh, are the, the current weekly uh, bar chart for this week is also much higher than all historical bars except for last week's. Um, so that's it's pretty cool. NFT volume up and to the right. David, this is, this is 80 million crypto art. Uh, I think that this is going to do an 100x this year. And, and the Agreed. reason why is we're Agreed. gonna get into easy. the news, right? Like, like celebrities. It's just mm -hmm. like the celebrities are just scratching the surface. People mm -hmm. with brands, people with communities are just scratching the surface. We're gonna talk about a, a few in the news section, um, but pay attention to the space because NFTs are going to have an absolutely massive year as right. they start to see mainstream adoption. Here is another set of metrics, which is automated market maker metrics. This is from Token Terminal, which is one of the best places to actually mm -hmm. um, look at DeFi data. They, they put together some fantastic analytics and metrics for various DeFi tokens. This is them reporting out automated market maker revenue. And David, I was struck by this when I saw it. Revenue since launch, $300 million Uniswap has generated in terms of revenue. Now, the vast majority of this went to its liquidity providers, right. but that is a crazy amount of top line mm -hmm. revenue for mm -hmm. a protocol to develop. And Uniswap's what, like two years old? Just right. a bit over two years old? These numbers are staggering already. I mean, look at that sushi swap number. Sushi swap is almost at a hundred million, and it's it was born in in September, and so like it's already like planted its flag in in revenue. Seventy three point nine million in revenue that sushi swap has generated for its LPs, and and let let me let it be known like this is why governance tokens are valuable. Like yes these fee, the revenues went to the liquidity providers, right? Those providing the value to the protocol. Yet it's the tokens that govern over the direction of this cash flow. And so uni token holders are able to point $300 million worth of revenue as they see fit. Uh, and that's just the power behind the uni token. And that's why the uni token has a market value.
You know, it's crazy to me is like sites like Token Terminal can show you insight visibility into all of this. We talk so often about DeFi and its killer killer uh, feature is that it's completely transparent, completely mm-hmm. transparent. So this kind of information, if you wanted this information about a traditional exchange or like even a, um, uh, you know, th- some sort of bank, uh, right. you'd have a to wait sheet. for their, yeah, yeah, you'd have to wait for their quarterly reports, basically. They'd have to be audited. You get that on a quarterly basis. This is all real-time and trustlessly verifiable on-chain information. So the quarterly report is kind of it's kind of dead when it goes up against yeah. on-chain protocols in this way. All right, David, let's talk about this last. And it also makes it really, really easy to produce content about because it's always something you <laughs> yes. to produce content every week. <laughs> Good <laughs> for content producers. There. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about this last stat. So ETH is now powering over 30 billion in stable coins. When we talked to Jeremy Allaire, Jeremy Allaire about stable coins uh, a couple of weeks ago, I feel like that number was maybe 20 billion or so. So we just added mm-hmm. a cool 10 billion. I think this number is going to absolutely skyrocket too, David. What's your take here? Yeah, I, I think this is worthy of a comparison. The, the Ethereum market cap, Ether market cap, is just slightly over $200 billion. And there's $30 billion of stable coins um, largely on uh, all on Ethereum, right? So that's a pretty decent percentage, right? Like to, uh, 200 over 30 or, or 30 over 200 or whatever. Um, and just, just think about all of the transactional demand that $30 billion worth of stable coins creates on Ethereum. Like, well, no, no, no shit gas prices are high. Like there's a lot of econ- economic activity to be done. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to talk about gas prices in a little bit, I think. Uh, David, that is the market. Gemini is the world's most trusted cryptocurrency exchange. I've been a customer of Gemini since I first got into crypto in 2017, and it's been my main exchange of choice to make my crypto buys and sells. Gemini is available in all 50 states and in over 50 countries worldwide. And on Gemini, there are markets for over 30 various different crypto assets, including many of the hot DeFi tokens. And it's one of the few exchanges that has liquid DIMAR. Markets. Gemini just launched their Earn program, where you can earn up to 7.4% interest on 26 various crypto assets. If you're tired of paying fees in DeFi, or you don't want to worry about DeFi exploits, but you still want to earn interest on your crypto assets, Gemini Earn is the product for you. Another product I'm stoked to get my hands on is the Gemini Crypto Back Credit Card, which gives you 3% cash back on all of your purchases, but paid to you in your preferred crypto asset. When I get my Gemini credit card, I'm going to make sure that I get my cash back in ETH. So whenever I buy something, I get a little bit of ETH bonus back to me at the same time. You can open up a free account in under three minutes at Gemini.com slash go bankless. And if you trade more than $100 within the first 30 days after sign up, you'll be gifted a free $15 Bitcoin bonus. Check them out at Gemini.com slash go bankless. If you want to live a bankless life, you need to get a Monolith DeFi Visa card. Monolith is a one-two punch of both an Ethereum smart contract wallet and an accompanying Visa card that lets you spend the money that you have in your Ethereum wallet everywhere where Visa is accepted. When you swipe your Monolith Visa card at the grocery store or at a restaurant, it actually makes a transaction on the Ethereum blockchain that spends some of the money you hold in your Monolith wallet. It's insanely cool and it's one of the best tools out there for living a bankless but still normal life. Monolith also offers on-ramp services for getting your fiat money into the world of DeFi. So it's trivial to top up your Monolith card if you ever need to, and your deposited money goes straight into your non-custodial wallet, so your money is never held by a centralized intermediary. Because Monolith is native Ethereum infrastructure, the money you hold in your Monolith wallet still has the power of DeFi behind it. Swapping assets on Uniswap or earning yield in DeFi is at your fingertips. Go to monolith.xyz and sign up to get your Monolith Visa card today. Let's turn to releases. The first is this from uh, from Matic, actually. Mm-hmm. So Matic, which is changing its name to, to Polygon, full disclosure, I am involved as an advisor to this project because I think they are doing great work. But David, what is the news here? Yeah, yeah, Matic is this. It's it's one of the Sandy Monica Pier metaphors. Uh, it's it's a it's a, it's an L two with a bunch of activities on it. So it's a it's a scaling platform uh, with uh, yeah, you know stuff like AMMs, borrowing and lending, a more expressive and composable type of L two than other L twos. Um, and it's it's doing this rebrand to Polygon, uh, which is c- kind of a cool name. There there are many many layers behind that name. Uh, not 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 enough time to go in it on the weekly rollups, um, but it's actually comparable to. Po- 
polka dot uh, is is that is the branding. This is what I'm hearing. I'm not a uh, expert on polygon or, or consensus design or L2 design, so take that with a grain of salt. But uh, this is a polka dot alternative as an L2 on Ethereum, uh, and so this is kind of part of Ethereum's power. Like if you can build it you could build it on Ethereum. And since all the uh, all the ready, all the activities on Ethereum, you might as well just build it on Ethereum. Um, and so I, I think the Polkadot v. Polygon uh, conversation is one that will be had for a long time. Absolutely. And it's it's Polkadot, it's Cosmos, it's, it's many of these uh, alternative layer ones who have the vision to be an internet of blockchains. The question is, can a Matic, can some of Ethereum's layer twos deliver that only have it secured by ethereum and how does that compete against these other competing layer ones we we've we've said before david that uh oftentimes it seems like many of the alternative eth killers or layer ones are actually competing against ethereum's layer two right and uh i guess we'll see how that plays out let's jump to the next uh hash masks david we talked about this last week and this came up mm -hmm. when we were talking about markets how big art is growing on crypto in the blockchain on NFTs in particular, Hashmas had an absolutely incredible week. You want to talk about this? Yeah. So we report when, when we record weekly rollups, we record it on Thursday. And so we talked about hash masks. Yeah. It had not yet finished up its first week of sales. And so if we take the, the second half of Thursday, Friday and Saturday sales for hash masks, we run into a number that is $13.4 million worth of sales in one week. So congratulations to hash masks for being absolutely successful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a crazy amount of growth. Uh, David, let's turn to this on releases. So Ledger is now providing access to Wallet Connect. Uh, what is Wallet Connect and why is this important? Yeah, Wallet Connect is like a middleware type uh, communication system for connecting your wallet to your application, right? Um, I use a Wallet Connect when I want to use my Argent with uh, a, some sort of uh, protocol. Uh, if I want to trade on Uniswap, I can go and open up my Argent wallet, and then I can scan the Wallet Connect integration into Uniswap, and that will link my Argent wallet with the Uniswap application. Uh, and so uh, people who use their ledger to connect to MetaMask, to connect to Uniswap, or to connect to, to a compound. This is a similar thing where MetaMask is, is offering that bridge. But now Wallet, Wallet Connect is offering that bridge for things that are Wallet Connect integrated. Uh, and so now we can go straight from a, your ledger to an application on Ethereum like Uniswap or Compound using Wallet Connect. And so it's, a, it's an alternative to MetaMask. Um, and so it's a new way to, to, uh, to connect the app. And, and I think that's actually kind of nice because we have as an industry complete dependency on MetaMask. Uh, and so having alternatives to connect to applications that aren't centered around MetaMask is nice. Agreed. And particularly from a hardware wallet, which which offers a tremendous amount of security for your crypto if you are custodying it. Let's move to, to this release. Uh, pool Together has built a prize pool builder. So does this mean, David, you can essentially create your own Pool Together lottery? Is, it, is that what this release is about? Yeah, yeah. Leighton Kusak, he's the CEO of Pool Together. And for those that don't know, Pool Together is a no loss lottery where you pool your funds. And then instead of putting your funds at risk in the lottery, you actually only put your interest into the lottery and then the winner gets the interest. And so it looks like this is a, a, a build a pool mechanism out of Pool Together, uh, which means that there's more composability and more options. And so what they are doing here is they're just making their surface area for building larger. And so people can build on top of them. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Nice job, Layton. Yeah, very cool. Uh, Pool Together has been doing a lot. Do you know how big they are these days? Like, I, I'm not sure how that's... I do uh, not have the numbers off the top of my head. No. Interesting. We'll have to look that up. All right. Uh, UMA Protocol. They are creating some novel community incentivization mechanisms. Uh, what is this, this latest that they've created? This is one of the DeFi protocols for synthetics and mm -hmm. um, options. Yeah, so UMA is a synthetic asset platform. And so what they are doing is they are making what they are calling KPI options. Uh, KPIs for those not in the marketing world is key performance indicators. Uh, and so it's really the numbers that you want to go after when you are trying to measure your skills at, at marketing. But what they're doing with KPI is not talking about marketing, but more talking about the protocol. There are a couple metrics about the protocol that they are turning into synthetic assets, right? And so the way that this works is that the synthetic asset that they, they are making is based off of a metric or an indicator about the protocol that they want to grow. 
And so if you hold the asset that tracks that indicator or that measure, you are then incentivized to make that indicator or measure go up, right? Because then the value of your asset goes up. So it's actually a really clever incentivization mechanism. And also the other through line is that these are now new native assets on top of Ethereum, right? No, no bank dependencies. These are trustless assets if you trust the protocol. Uh, and there, and all what similar to synthetics, the protocol for your synthetic assets, UMA is just a, able to be a factory for types of assets that track types of measures. If you can codify it, you can create an asset out of it. And that's what UMA has done here. So interesting. So they're creating uh, new ways to incent their community to do and to do what they want, essentially. So they're mm -hmm. using tokenization and tokens as an incentive, and they're giving away 2 million UMA tokens for this purpose. David, it strikes me, there are just so many ways to earn tokens by mm -hmm. using DeFi protocols these days. And this is, this is yet another one. And I'm wondering if this kind of token incentivization will, will catch on across other protocols if it becomes popular. Totally, totally agree. All right, let's go to the next, David. So uh, Coinbase Custody is now supporting deposits and withdrawals of Sushi. So that is always a precursor of things to come. So if it, if it goes into their Coinbase Custody, then generally it ends up on their exchange. I'm just blown away at how fast this is happening. Mm -hmm. Like Sushi is a relatively mm -hmm. new token and already we're getting to the stage where it's about to be on Coinbase. In 2017, there were layers and layers and months and months you had to kind of go through to get a coin to get a token listed on something like Coinbase. Now it seems like anybody can, mm -hmm. is going on Coinbase. Like, what's mm -hmm. what's your take on this? Yeah, you, you beat me to the punch, Ryan. So like uh, with the Coinbase custody, co Coinbase custody is actually not indicative of it making it to the exchange. Uh, not all the time. Uh, it, there are plenty of tokens that go into Coinbase custody that don't make it onto the Coinbase exchange. However, the reason why we're including it in this week is I think this is totally the exception. Uh, I think Sushi is getting included on Coinbase custody because they are gearing up for the Coinbase listing. That is my speculation. I have no more information other than that, but I think, I think we can definitely be preparing for it a sushi listing on Coinbase. All right, David, that has been releases. Let's get to the news, my friend. We've got to start with some of the biggest news of the year for sure. Mm -hmm. What is it? Yeah, it's the uh, Tesla, which is a company that everyone knows, per, put $1.5 billion of Bitcoin on its balance sheet. And, you know, Elon Musk, the world's richest man, the man with some of the world's greatest meme power behind him and some of the biggest audiences behind him now is publicly a Bitcoin holder, basically, um, by, by proxy of also being the largest Tesla shareholder. Uh, so Elon Musk has a bunch of Bitcoin on his personal balance sheet, technically, uh, and Tesla has Bitcoin on its balance sheet. Everyone loves Tesla. Everyone loves Elon Musk. And that's what caused them. The, Bitcoin's largest one-day candle. We missed this topic in the uh, markets, but Bitcoin had its largest one-day candle ever of over $8,000 increase in one day. And we can definitely thank Elon Musk and Tesla for getting that done. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, the after effects and shock, shock waves out of this are going to be massive and last for a really long time. Uh, and I, I, I always try and say this, like, moving up price targets and being bullish just because other people are bullish is always a bad idea. But I can't help and not think just as like, dude, the world's richest man and one of the world's most beloved companies is now like publicly known to own a $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. And then also Bitcoin went up, by the way. So now it's more like $1.8 billion worth of Bitcoin. Uh, and I think that this could just, if this is, this is one of the biggest catalysts of a bull market that I could think of. And so like, maybe the bull market is going to be even bigger than I thought it was who knows yeah this is absolutely this is massive news so what what they did was they took 11 percent of their cash position and rather than hold it in cash that's huge that's i know huge. 11 percent is is huge and rather than hold it in cash they they they're, they're holding it now in crypto money in in bitcoin specifically and you're absolutely right david it's one thing for a company like like microstrategy that you know some have said uh well microstrategy didn't really have anything else to do with the money you know, their, their, their product was kind of a, a little older, perhaps it's in the business intelligence space. They were just sitting on this fund. What else were they going to do with it? Tesla has a lot of things it could do with its money. It is trying to grow into the world's largest, like, um, you know, battery provider, basically. Right. Um, it has endless ambitions, Silicon Valley level amb ambitions, and it is deciding to put its funds into crypto money. 
So this is not a micro strategy. This is one of the top companies in the mm -hmm. world. And you have to wonder who's going to be next, David. Is right. this just going to cause a cascading effect of like tons of Fortune 500 companies making this same move? Or did Elon kind of front run them and they're just going to let it play out? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a take that we're going to get to in the take section that is about this that I will save for later. So I'm going to tease that. But it's all about the economics and incentives behind putting Bitcoin on public companies' balance sheets. So stay tuned for this take section. So that was huge. That happened this week. And then we also had Joe Lubin on where we talked about ETH CME futures. That was almost overshadowed. I feel like whenever ETH has a has a big day, some mm -hmm. big news, like Bitcoin comes in with big like a big brother yeah. and he's like, no, uh -huh. step aside. Yeah. I've got something bigger I'm announcing and sort of overshadows <laughs> yeah. it. And that's totally what happened on Monday. Mm -hmm. ETH futures launched on Monday at the same time, uh, Elon Musk, uh, you know, kind of not announced, but it was revealed that Tesla had purchased the Bitcoin. But this is still... Massive, Massive news. And the CME, this this is the headline, saw nearly 400 ETH futures contracts traded on the first full market day. Refresh me, David. I know you wrote a post this week. Right. 400 ETH futures. About how much ETH is that? Yeah. So one ETH contract is worth 50 Ether. So 400 ETH futures contracts is 20,000 Ether. So on the first day, 20,000 Ether was traded. Uh, looks like it was actually 19.4 thousand, you know, close enough. Um, <laughs> uh, and that, and uh, the interesting comparison I saw was that I think this was roughly 2.5 times larger, the amount of volume that Bitcoin got on its first day when CME opened up Bitcoin futures back in 2017. Um, this is part, partly true. True, just because of you know the the whole entire space is more uh, mature and people are more hungry to get into ether and and uh, other crypto assets and so the the fact that we are seeing a much larger first day volume than we saw three years ago is uh, with a the second largest crypto asset rather than the first large uh, largest crypto asset is just really healthy really good strong signs. So the the manager of this product uh, from the CME had this quote that. The response to Ether has been overwhelming. Uh, qu quite the quote there, David. Do you think that, so we had this discussion and there's the community is somewhat divided. There, there are some who think that uh, CME futures kind of mark maybe uh, the end of the Ether bull run, right? right. So, and, and the reason for this is, is somewhat historical. They, they're taking a data point from the launch of Bitcoin futures in December 2017 or like late 2017. Uh, and then after that, not long after, the kind of the bubble burst and right. uh, we, we saw the end of the 2017 run. And they're projecting that. They're saying that, well, this that caused the end of the last bull run. So maybe it could cause the end of this bull run or or at least the end of the bull run specific to Ether. What's your take on that? I think that's the stupidest goddamn take I could ever <laughs> think of. Like, first off, let's just go with statistics here. You can't extrapolate from one data point. So like when B Bitcoin futures opened up, Bitcoin had gone from $250 to $20,000 and then Bitcoin futures opened up. Like what? Like no shit, Bitcoin's going to go down after that. First, you give the option to short the asset to people with large amounts of money who play on CME futures and Bitcoin just went up like a thousand X. Like that's not good data. That's confounding data. You know, Ether is only it's only two or three hundred dollars above its previous all time high, not not 200 times it's above its all time high. Like, no, no, this is bullish. Like everyone who's giving out that opinion needs to stop because it's wrong. It, well, it's interesting because it, it sort of amplified amplified the 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 popping of the um, the the last bull run, but it could have the same amplification effect here, but in the other direction. Yeah, right. This could right. this that's, could that's swell the right up take. the balloon, and um, it, it's interesting to see how that'll play out. But uh, yeah, I think you're right, especially when we have news like mm -hmm. this. Mastercard. We, we, we like to defer to the bullish side of things. Yeah. On the program. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, well, it's been right so far. So we'll see how it goes. Um, let's talk about Mastercard. Mastercard is bringing crypto onto its network. This is a press release from Mastercard. And here's the money quote We are preparing right now for the future of crypto and payments, announcing mm -hmm. that this year Mastercard will start supporting cryptocurrencies directly on our network. We've seen Visa say something to the same effect. It seems like fintech and traditional payment processes processors are moving big on crypto, particularly in stable coins. What's the take here? 
Yeah, things like MasterCard and Visa, all they are are networks. They're not denominations. Like there's nothing intrinsic about MasterCard or Visa that is US dollar based or like you could in theory put Bitcoin on the Visa network. That is something that's possible to happen. And so all we have to do is we have got to swap out whatever uh, whatever payment rails MasterCard is using with crypto payment rails and, and now not even swap out, keep the old ones, add on new ones. And you can now integrate like a MasterCard USDC underlying on some likely an L2 because L1 is slower and more congested than what MasterCard would need. But like the fight behind being the payments for crypto assets uh, the payments network for crypto assets is it's massive, right? And it's not just uh, Visa and MasterCard that's playing in, in this game. It's also PayPal. It's also um, it's also DeFi protocols like Loopring are they are also playing in this in this in this uh, arena. Uh, and of course, MasterCard is also now uh, getting in with a, a big bold step into the world of crypto payments. It, it, I always think when I read headlines like this, why MasterCard is bringing crypto onto its network? These are headlines you would have never seen in 2017. That's why this time it is different, right? Like we're, we're seeing a, another level of adoption, something that we right. didn't see in the previous bull run. Uh, and it's super exciting. Speaking of which, uh, we were talking about celebrities endorsing and getting into the art and NFT game. Let's talk about this one. A major soccer player in mm -hmm. uh, the EU has just launched his NFT. Who is this and what, what what's going on here? Yeah, uh, Mesut Ozil, I think is how you pronounce his name. Uh, famous uh, football player for all of the European and non-American listeners. Um, I don't watch televised sports. And so uh, I don't really know who this guy is, but apparently he's <laughs> a really big deal. He's got like 38 million Twitter followers, which is just a few more Twitter followers than I have. Um, and uh, he's minting an NFT, right? And this is this is just the, the future of the bull market, or at least when it comes to NFTs. Is the in, the incentive for celebrities or people with fans or just creators in general to mint NFTs to figure out how to commercialize themselves is absolutely massive, right? And so the the NFTs are just going to gain massive tailwinds for every single celebrity that wants to try and and monetize themselves, which is Last every single celebrity, by the way. It was, it was interesting. We didn't have NFTs in 2017. And so what we saw toward the end of the, the, the bull market was all of these celebrities, you know, talking about launching coins, right? And, and the trouble with that was the SEC came down on right. them and said, look, you know, you can't do that. Uh, the, right. These are securities. You can't go in that direction. Uh, we've got a comment from the SEC. This is uh, Crypto Mom, Hester Pierce mm -hmm. from the SEC. And like she, we love her. She's fantastic. And she is still... Uh, one of the commissioners of the SEC, um, even though there's a new chairperson in, in the Biden administration. Anyway, her comment is, the market is ready for a Bitcoin ETF. Yes, it is. We're ready for a Bitcoin ETF, aren't we, David? Yeah. So what she's saying is that the, the market is structured in ways that could that an ETF could get approved. In this article, we're seeing an ETP. I think that means an exchange traded product. I'm pretty sure what she means is an ETF. Um, and like so, all of the boxes, what, according to Hester Pierce, all of the boxes that are are needed to be checked. Uh, for Bitcoin to get an ETF are checked. And so Hester is saying, let's get this ETF underway. And like, I totally agree. All, all the, the, the lack of there being an ETF for Bitcoin and other crypto assets means it's, it's, a, it's a failure on the SEC to protect consumers because then they have to go into Grayscale. And again, this is not Grayscale's fault, but the fact that there's so much demand for Bitcoin, it means people are buying the Grayscale trust version of Bitcoin, which has a premium associated with it. Same thing with Ether. And this is, something that uh, the ETF version of Bitcoin is supposed to fix. So like, let's start protecting these consumers, SEC. Like, let's get the show on the road. Let's get this ETF out the door. Could you imagine what would happen to crypto prices if the news of an ETF was released? Like, is that is that just the catalyst for the rest of the bull run? Or, or does that in some weird way mark the end of the bull run? I put out a tweet earlier this week uh, after Elon Musk announced putting Bitcoin on his balance sheet. And I said, you know what? At this point, a, a bear market is impossible. I'm increasing the price <laughs> okay. targets to infinity. I put a little infinity sign. It, it was a joke because obviously it's a joke about how people move up their price targets when they get more bullish. And that's a fallacy and you shouldn't do that. But but Bitcoin put or if Bitcoin is on Tesla's balance sheets and we're probably going to get a Bitcoin ETF. If we also get a Bitcoin ETF, like, I don't know how, how will this bull market actually end? Like, where does it actually stop? Like, there's too much good news.
There's too much good news into the future that that just hasn't clicked in yet. And then a lot of unexpected good news that has already hit to fuel the early stage of this bull market. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, speaking of good news that may be yet to come, Twitter is considering Bitcoin putting it on its balance sheet. Twitter, of course, is uh, partially controlled by, by Jack Dorsey, but this is, uh, he, who's the CEO, this is their CFO talking about this. Like, there are a relatively small number of corporate executives and CEOs and CFOs uh, in corporate America, right? And they all talk to one another. That's why last week, David, when we were talking about Michael Saylor and he put on this kind of seminar for other uh, corporate executives and, and CEOs who talk about Bitcoin, and he was like guiding them through the process of what it takes to actually put it on your balance sheet, right? Um, they're all super networked and they like, they move as one, they get FOMO too. Mm -hmm. So like uh, Bezos, he sees what Elon's doing. He's like, oh God, man, he front run ran me, but I got to get in before Zuck did. And he goes right. and he puts like, <laughs> it's just such a small group of people, right? Like making these decisions. Uh, and uh, it do does feel like something's building and about to cascade here. What's your take? Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to bring up a take from the take section and, and talk about it right here. I already hinted at it earlier in this recording. Uh, this actually came from Pierre Richard, who's like a Bitcoin maxi of Bitcoin maxis. And he <laughs> made this prediction that uh, over 50 percent of S&P 500 companies will have Bitcoin on its balance sheet by the end of 2021. And his rationale was this. Um, Company X announces that Bitcoin, that they put X number of Bitcoins on the balance sheet. They make the announcement, the Bitcoin price goes up and the stock price of the company goes up at the same time. Like <laughs> the incentives are too strong. And so we've already had three examples of this where some company put Bitcoin on its balance sheet, made the announcement, Bitcoin pumped, and then the company share price pumped at the same time. We're just going to get that repeated over and over until and it over. Until it stops and working. They're going to yeah, just un do until it until it stops, it stops working. working. Until yeah. it stops working. That's exactly right. And at that point in time, Bitcoin's going to be worth like $10 million of Bitcoin. It's <laughs> crazy. And like the, the, the bull market is going to like blow up half the world or something. Yeah, I think I think that there's an element of truth there for sure that that will continue to happen. And then maybe when Bitcoin stops working as much, maybe then they go downstream and start doing other assets. So what's the first publicly traded company that's going to put ETH on its balance sheet now that it has CME futures? Um, absolutely, that's how bull markets tend to go. They they certainly go in herds and they try the same things until they stop working. Um, David, let's, let's talk. Let's not, let's not give institutions too much credit, though, because they can put Bitcoin on their balance sheet, but that doesn't mean that they have diamond hands. Institutions can also be paper hands, too. So while there can be a massive, massive winding up, institutions can FOMO out of Bitcoin just as fast as they can FOMO into Bitcoin. So that those diamond hands can turn into institutional paper hands real quick. Honestly, the longer I'm in this space, David, the less I believe that there is such a thing as smart money. It's all psychology, like all it's the way down, psychology. whether yep. it's institutional or whether it's retail, it's all psychology. Um, let's jump to this, which is the amount of gas that Coinbase is using. So Coinbase, of course, an exchange, we call them crypto banks. Did you know, David, it uses 25% of all ETH block space, one fourth of all ETH block space with one crypto bank. This is Will Price on Twitter. He's saying with different architecture, it could use 20 to 40% less gas. What What's your take here? Why isn't um, Coinbase optimizing its gas usage? And were you surprised by that number? One fourth of all ETH gas. Yeah, so uh, I, I knew that Coinbase uses an insane amount of ETH block space. I did not know that it use, it is using 25% of ETH block space and is doing that when there's no the, the most amount of block space for demand on Ethereum ever. So like they must be absolutely burning cash. And I actually know, I kind of know what it's like to work in a, in a centralized company that uh, needs to make transactions on Ethereum as part of its day-to-day -day operations. And so you have to make those transactions no matter what the gas fee is, it hurts. It hurts. Um, the thing is, Coinbase is a massive company that is extremely well funded, and so they're just paying the bill. They're just saying like, oh, like how much are we paying for you know the last twenty four hours worth of block space? Oh, three million dollars. Okay, it's nothing. Like, you know, not a big nothing, deal for them. Like whatever. Uh, and so like, and, and to be honest, like Coinbase is a little bit too big. Like they grew really fast, really really fast, and now they're kind of hard to get that ship turned. Um, and I think this is kind of just a, a, a signal of, a, of, a, stress, of a, a startup being stress tested. They can't really figure out how to pivot fast enough to start to not pay ridiculous gas prices. But 
Coinbase, it would be really nice on all of our budgets if you could figure out how to optimize your gas usage. Like, come on, guys, let's let's do this. Well, this is interesting, Dave, and I want to get back to this when we get to the take section, but this is an example of um, economic density, right? So like the more economically dense transactions on Ethereum will persist because of the way ETH gas is auctioned up. It's basically highest bidder wins. And if you're Coinbase and you're making millions a day, these gas fees are, are nothing to you. You're making way more. And But if you're uh, say issuing NFT, right? You're a small time artist and you're trying to pay gas fees to like trade, exchange your NFT, right? Um, well, that transaction is much less economically dense than all the Coinbase transactions settling, you know, millions of, of uh, stable coin dollars in, in value. So let's get back to that soon when we talk about ETH gas. But David, a few other things we got to hit in the news. This one, the Federal Reserve put out a research paper about what? About DeFi, the wow. Federal Reserve, St. Louis. And they, they, they put together this fantastic diagram. David, I've seen this diagram before. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've seen it in early Familiar, edition right? of Bankless articles, but it's a fantastic mm -hmm. uh, diagram to describe the layers of DeFi, the settlement layer at the bottom is um, is Ethereum. We've got an asset layer, protocol layer, application layer. If you're on YouTube, you can see this with us. What is your take on this article and about the fact that the St. Louis Fed published it? Yeah, so uh, I actually talked to the author behind this uh, behind this article, Fabian. Uh, perhaps a Bankless podcast in the future? Question mark. Uh, is it in the works? Maybe it is. Uh, he, he's a really he's a really smart guy, and he, he's a he's a professor. He's a professor, and that specifically teaches crypto networks, DeFi, uh, and he so he can speak at a level of like three hundred one, four hundred one type of uh, of of you know at, at that kind of level with regards to DeFi, and so and he's I been reading that, Bankless for the last and, year and, and a half, so that helps. Yeah. He, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Like he uses Bankless as a as a, a place to cite, which is pretty cool. Um, so Bankless made it into the uh, the research arm of the Federal Bank, which is the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. Yeah, it's it's cool, and um, I think that would that would make a great podcast, David. We should. We should I, I think it, I think it would make a podcast. He should come on Bankless. <laughs> Very good. All right, um, a few other things. BN, BNY Mellon. I'm just going to actually read this headline: Bitcoin to come to America's oldest bank, America's oldest bank, BNY Mellon. So this is another traditional bank who's capitulating and opening up a way for its customers to do custody, digital currency custody. More and more banks. I feel like this is going to be a regular thing on these rollups too, David. Let's get to a couple more. Urine Finance had an exploit uh, last week or so, right before last I think week, yeah. mm -hmm. the last the last rollup. It was an eleven was on million Friday, dollar yeah. loss, and th this is what we say. We say at the end of every Bankless podcast, like this is the frontier. You could lose what you put in. Folks who were using one of the urine, well, the wire urine vaults, I think it was a die specific vault. They lost money. They lost $11 yeah. million. I actually had a friend who texted me and was like, oh shoot, <laughs> I had I had funds in this. And oh, I was no. like, I'm sorry. But I also said, I bet your wire and governance will mm -hmm. uh, issue these funds and make vault older um, vault holders whole, and that is exactly what they did as well. So, wh what's your comment on this? Both the the hack itself, and then mm -hmm. the the restoration to make why uh, earn vault holders whole. Yeah, so I actually made this prediction in the issue, the 2021 uh, uh, Bankless predictions uh, that I, I predicted that there was going to be a loss of funds from a faulty vault out of Wyern. Uh, and that came true in, in February. That happened pretty frequently. The, the thesis behind this is that uh, there's just a lot of surface area with hacking or ex exploits when it comes to, to urine. They, they touch so many different protocols. And so every time you touch a new protocol, you, you are adding in another layer of, uh, layer of complexity and another way for an exploit to happen. Uh, and so um, sorry to any of the why die uh, holders that, that got their funds snagged, but uh, conveniently, Yearn had just voted to mint 6,666. I think that's the right number. Double, uh, we, listeners should double check that. Uh, but mint 6,000 ish uh, you know, YFI tokens, which is a lot of money. Uh, and so that more, was more than enough to compensate people who lost funds. And, you know, protocols are supposed to be protocols, but also to the end, at the end of the day, we can be like pragmatic and say, you know, 
a protocol that can compensate its uh, use use its centralized coordination abilities behind the the urine team to compensate people that lost funds. Like people are going to feel better about that. Like I'll people that lost money in in urine and then if they didn't get compensated, probably will never go back. But people that did lose money in urine but then did get compensated for that will like, like say thanks thanks for compensating for me and I'll stay with the protocol like it, it's a, it's a trust growing mechanism so nice job for for uh, compensating people urine it's super interesting cuz what's the lesson here right the first lesson is uh here's another example defi is risky be careful mm -hmm. where you put your funds in smart contracts they can be hacked they can be exploited but the second re uh lesson is also that oh my god some of these defi protocols are flush with cash and they do have this social coordination mechanism, this token governance feature, which allows them to make um, those who are exploited whole. And we've seen this happen time and time again. So it's almost like a, a mixed message here, right? One is like, be mm -hmm. careful, risk off. The other is like, yeah, but there's also some built-in insurance in DeFi. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's interesting to see how that, how that happens. David, let's talk about the last thing before we move on to some takes for the week. This is the uh, Avalanche blockchain. What happened with Avalanche this week? It's not a chain that we talk about too much, but there was some news. It broke. Okay. The Avalanche blockchain broke. It stopped going. Uh, and uh, if anyone remembers my tirade against the frogs, it actually started off with me talking about Avalanche and, and, and the genesis of the conversation was that um, Avalanche was given praise for being this blockchain that moves fast and breaks things. Uh, or maybe that wasn't the word. They, 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 I think the word wording was they ship really, really fast. Um, and I, I said in the comments, you know, well, when it comes to L1 things, like you actually don't want a blockchain that ships really, really fast. You want a blockchain that's really careful and moves really slowly and methodically. Uh, and that's how I would characterize Ethereum development, even though Bitcoiners would characterize Ethereum development as too fast. <laughs> I guess I guess everything is, is uh, subjective and by, you know, a comparison at the end of the day. But I think when your Avalanche blockchain breaks and stops going, that's an indication that you have moved too fast and you should have slowed, slowed down. But also what happened when you said that? Did you get like, did, did you get an oh, yeah. angry mob on? on oh, yeah, I got a huge angry mob. And that's kind of what's triggered the the whole my, my fight against the green frogs. But that's a, that's, a, that's a topic for a different day. Hard to know who is real and who is a bot on things like Twitter, um, mm -hmm. especially now in the bull run. Aave is a borrowing and lending protocol on Ethereum and just recently released Aave version 2, which has a ton of cool new features that makes using Aave even more powerful. With Aave, you can leverage the full power of DeFi, Money Legos, Yield, and Composability all in one application. On Aave, there are a ton of assets that you can deposit in order to gain yield, and all of those same assets can also be borrowed from the protocol if you have deposited collateral. Here you can see me getting a 200 USDC loan against my portfolio of a number of different DeFi tokens and ETH. I'll choose a variable interest rate because it's a lower rate than the stable interest rate option, but I could choose the stable interest rate option if I wanted to lock that interest rate in permanently. One of Aave's V2 features is the ability to switch swap collateral without having to withdraw your assets, trade them on Uniswap, and then deposit them back into Aave. Aave does all of this for you, all in one seamless transaction, so you don't have to repay loans in order to change the collateral you have backing them. Check out the power of Aave at Aave.com. That's A-A-V-E.com. Synthetix is Ethereum's decentralized derivatives liquidity protocol. What does that mean? Synthetix is a platform for creating and trading synthetic assets, which are assets that are priced via an oracle rather than bids or asks. Traders can use the Quenta exchange, which hosts and trades all of the synthetic assets created by Synthetix. Traders on Quenta can trade synthetic tokens like SBTC, SOIL, or SDFI. Because Quenta is powered by synthetics, traders experience zero slippage on their trades. No, I didn't mean low slippage, I meant no slippage, because that is the power of the synthetics platform. No slippage on your trades. You can also easily short assets with iSynths, which are synthetic assets that move inversely to their target asset. Synthetics isn't just for traders, developers can build on synthetics to access 
the infinite liquidity offered by synthetic assets. Or investors can stake collateral to the protocol and earn fees that the protocol collects. If you're a trader and you're looking for a trading platform and not found in the legacy world, check out Quenta.io. If you're a developer or you just want to earn yield on your collateral, go to www.synthetics.io where you can stake your SNX or ETH and earn fees from synthetics. David, let's get to the takes. Um, this is the first. We're nowhere near the top is kind mm -hmm. of the take. And here is a graph that is showing in blue um, ICO searches on Google, on Google. I believe. Uh, and it shows it from 2017 up till now. And you see this chart where it goes from like zero to 100. And 100 is is really peak ICO, peak 2017, peak mania of the you know last what? bubble. You know what chart that looks like, Ryan? What? The ETH price chart. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> totally does. Okay, so it looks uh -huh. like the ETH price chart. And then, and it's just this mountain. Um, right. And then you see this other, uh, this other line, which is DeFi. And DeFi is mm -hmm. a search term. And it's much lower. It's hanging out at like between 1, one and 10 mm -hmm. for all of 2017, all of 2018, all of 2019. And it's only just gone up a little bit, still That's under... You know, twenty or so. It's just hit twenty, mm -hmm. so nowhere near the the level of twenty seventeen. This is basically comparing the search term mania of ICOs versus DeFi, and what it's saying is, DeFi hasn't even started to enter into the public consciousness. People aren't even searching it at this state at this stage. Um, you're talking about like, well, is DeFi in a bubble? Is it not? Uh, in in this in this most recent DeFi season, we're nowhere close to what we were for ICOs in 2017. I don't think anybody is talking about DeFi on CNBC at this point. Uh, so if this plays out like 2017, it feels like we've got a long way to right. go in this. Is this mm -hmm. what this is saying to us? Yeah. So the the DeFi matching the uh, ICO search terms back in 2017 is, in my opinion, the floor, because I think this bull market is going to be bigger than the last bull market. So the if it once DeFi matches the ICO search terms back in 2017, that I think is the minimum it's going to get to. I think it's going to go well beyond that. And if you look at this chart, you can you can definitely see uh, DeFi starting to tick upwards. It's definitely growing. But like like you were saying, in comparison to what ICOs were back in 2017, it's still it's still a blip. Like there's still so much left to, to go in this market. Absolutely. And it does seem like DeFi tokens are going to be the ICOs of the previous run. Is that that's what this is implying as well? Yeah. And hopefully it, it is just capturing the energy and not the scamminess. Um, from what <laughs> we've seen so far in DeFi, I'm actually pretty proud of the lack of scamminess in comparison to what we saw in 2017 ICOs. Uh, cross my fingers and, and knock on wood that that stays the same. Um, I definitely do expect scamminess and bad behavior to come into the space, but so far, so good. So far, everything about DeFi that I've seen, I, I really, really like. And all the stuff I don't like is, is staying small and kind of under the radar, which is good. And, and that might be an indication of the, the early stage of this, this bull run. I bet we'll tend to see some scammier and worse projects as time goes on, as the bull run uh, really kicks off. David, let's talk about gas fees because that actually could be an impediment uh, to this vision. So gas fees are high and it sucks. If you're a DeFi user, it sucks. I'll tell you one thing that really sucks. This is like getting, have you ever been gas jailed? So maybe you have some stable coins in an ETH account, right? So let's say you had $100 worth of DAI inside of one of your ETH accounts and ETH address. And uh, it takes like $30 to move that DAI from one ETH address to somewhere else, right? So that's $30 out of your $100. And what can happen is if you have small enough amounts, this is not even worth the cost to actually do anything with your assets in the ETH address. This is a problem, isn't it? Like, what is the problem of gas fees? I guess your take on that first. And then um, wh what does it say about the Ethereum network? Yeah, so the whole point of Ethereum is to be maximally inclusive. And right now it's not 
it's not fulfilling that that vision. And that's why Ethereum 2.0 is, is that's the whole effort behind Ethereum 2.0. Ethereum 2.0 is supposed to scale so we can have more people and transact on the base layer. And it's also supposed to scale, uh, scale its consensus and let everyone be a part of that. That's part of the vision of Ethereum, maximum inclusivity. If you have been priced out of that, that's Ethereum failing in its in its vision, but it's also uh, on its way to uh, to achieving that. Again, that's the whole point of Ethereum 2.0. So like there, we are in this unfortunate like uncanny valley between like DeFi is really awesome. It's the future. Like there's tons of value and speculative uh, upside to be gained here. So you need to be playing in it. Yet also, sorry, we also haven't solved the gas fee issues. Like <laughs> we're in this very painful time where we're like we're between these two things. Um, and and I think that that's where uh, scaling solutions like like Loopring, uh, Polygon, which we talked about earlier, um, uh, you know, zk rollups, optimistic rollups, you know, uh, uh, Synthetics is on optimism. You know, Uniswap's L2 is coming out, and so I think that's really going to be the stopgap between um, that's going to help Ethereum scale before sharding comes out. But again, we're actually not there yet either. Uh, Loopring, you can actually start to do some trading on some ETH to DAI or ETH to USEC trades. And so if you are trading Ether on Uniswap, maybe try out Loopring. You can you can uh, do you know faster trades with pennies rather than dollars. Um, but yeah, I just think that this is going to be an unfortunate period of pain, but that's just the precursor to growth in my opinion. I agree. I think this is the process of DeFi has to kind of re-architect itself on on layer two and off of layer one. But but what happens to to layer one is we've used this analogy when we talked to Hasib in a, in a podcast of like the Ethereum mainnet. That's Manhattan, and Manhattan uh, property pr like prices are just going to go up and up and up. Like the value of of Manhattan is very high because Manhattan has everything. It has network effect. There's better jobs. There's better opportunity. Uh, lots of people want to live in Manhattan. And so as, as much of, as this is kind of painful for smaller DeFi users, it's also a marker of product market fit of Ethereum, right? So like it's, it's, it's very striking that all of these other ETH killers have basically like empty blocks. They're basically like zombie coin, like chains, right? There's nothing going on. Their gas fees are very low because no one's actually filling them up. No one's actually using them. Everybody would rather pay super high gas fees on Ethereum rather than go onto this this ETH killer chain. So that is also interesting. I would I would characterize like the story of high gas fees as well as just being like two words. It's insane demand. That's why gas fees are so high. And I do think David that um, the reality is uh, we talk about Ethereum as a credibly neutral settlement layer. That's worth a lot. So block space in a credibly neutral settlement layer is worth a lot more than block space on, you know, Binance Smart Chain, right? Which is mm -hmm. you know, controlled by 21 different validators all associated with, with, with Binance, right? I, that is less credibly neutral. And how much are people going to pay for that block space? A lot less. So there's mm -hmm. something interesting about this. And it goes back to our conversation earlier. Um, Coinbase settling on Ethereum, consuming 25% of its block space, paying these, these massive fees. What, what's going to happen on mainnet is the transaction fees are going to become more and more compact, more and more economically dense. So pretty soon a transaction on Ethereum main chain is going to contain all of the economic value of a roll-up chain, like, like Loopring, or all of the economic value that's going on inside of a, a Coinbase. And these transactions are going to become more and more dense. So some people talk about um, Ethereum solving its gas fees. And what they think that means is it's going to go back to like 2018 when, when gas fees were really low. I don't think that's going to be the case. Like the reality is gas fees are probably like they'll have... They'll have ebbs and flows. They'll go down a little, but they're probably never going to go down to 2018 level. What is going to happen is we are going to start to be able to fit more economic value, more trustless economic value in every transaction, in every unit of block space in Ethereum. And I think that's how it's going to play out. Hasib's model of Manhattan, I think, is really, really helpful here. So like what's going on is the Ethereum L1 blockchain is, is a city. It's Manhattan. Everyone wants to live there. And we don't have any other suburbs. There's nothing else other than Manhattan in the Ethereum universe. And so there's two ways to create more land. 
we shard or we create L2s and sharding's not here yet. And so L2s are creating, we keep using the Santa Monica pier, but like the really, the Santa Monica pier is really, really big. And so like, there's this place where you can go to now that loop ring is here. Now that polygon is here. Now that, you know, insert your L2 is here. Uh, there's what we are doing is we are, the, we are building land. We are creating new land to uh, absorb some of the overflow that is uh, people's demand for trying to live in Manhattan. So we're, it's a matter of creating new land for people to live on right and so that if that's why people are bullish on polygon people are bullish on loopring because it's it's new real estate it's new real estate to 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 leverage right and so i think you're totally right i don't think l1 gas fees are going to go down ever i think where we there where they are now is probably actually going to be where they are going to stay for a really long time it's just that there's going to be overflow options and that's going to be how we solve gas there's going to be places to go to overflow that demand and capture that overflow that's the, the goal of all L2s is to capture the overflow for people that don't want to transact on the L1. So what do you do if you're a DeFi user? I guess some gas tips. One thing I think you can do is buy ETH. Like generally earlier is better when price was lower. Like buying ETH two years ago would have hedged mm -hmm. you against all of the USD price increases of gas. So that's one thing right. that you can do is because you know gas fees and the price of ETH are somewhat correlated. Uh, and uh, you can kind of like minimize the cost that way with ETH price appreciation. Another thing you've got to do is um, have fewer accounts, to be honest. You can't have your, your funds spread out across like 20 or 30 different ETH addresses because like it, 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 it it, it's hard when you when you start doing that to you, you split your funds up into smaller and smaller pieces and it's not like worth it to move $30 right. out of a specific ETH account. Do you have any other gas tips, uh, David, for yeah. DeFi users? Yeah, I, I would say like, and, and especially during bull markets and especially if this is your first bull market, I know what it's like. You see a token that some that your friend just mentioned, or you see a token that's pumping. And you're like, mm, I got to get some. First <laughs> off, no, you no, no, you don't. And second off, when you look at that Uniswap trade and you're saying like, okay, I'm going to buy $200 worth of this token and it's going to cost me $30 in gas. Uh, it's $30 in gas denominated in ether, right? So if you ape into that token that you might sell later tomorrow, depending on how you're feeling when you wake up in the morning, you paid $30 worth of ether to make that trade. And that's not dollars, that's ether. And so if ether goes to 10 K that $30 is going to like $300, right? So remember when you are paying gas, it's not dollar denominated, it's ether denominated, and you are giving up your fees in ether to pay for that. So like sl think slower, don't make uh, do make intentional slower trades. You don't have to buy every single token. And if you don't, if you don't buy every single token, you get to keep more ether and that's good for you anyways. There you go, David, we got to put an article together with all of these gas saving tips. Uh, we'll do that sometime on Bankless. Um, is, is just buying ether a, a real, a good tip or is that just <laughs> ETH maximalism? <laughs> I mean, it, it worked a bit better when you were buying it in 2018 yeah. than now, but like, yes, buy and hold can, can hedge you against that a little bit. Well, here, here's a take that's kind of related, uh, to that from Ashley on Twitter. What, how do you pronounce Ashley's last name? Oh, uh, Shap. I think, I think it's Shap. Okay. Ashley actually Shap on Twitter. Uh, so she says the first cell phone came out in 1983 and picture it, it was 11 inches long, two and a half pounds and cost $4,000 early mm -hmm. adoption is expensive and clunky. I think that says it all right there. We are early adopters in DeFi and on mm -hmm. Ethereum and transactions are expensive and they're clunky at this stage in the game. We're right. early. We're at the frontier. Like with mm -hmm. that is. Uh, some UX pain, some risk, right. some challenge, but there's also reward because when else are you going to buy ETH at these prices and crypto at these prices? So there's a tremendous amount of upside, but keep in mind how early we are. This is like cell phones in the 1980s. This is like the internet in the early 1990s. This is like, um, uh, give me another one, David. What is this like? Oh gosh! Oh, put me on the spot. Uh, this, this is like uh, your your uh, pre iPod, like you know, hold your disc in your Walkman. Like uh, what was it called? The Microsoft Zune. Did you ever see no, people with a Zune? Zunes were relatively late. That that, that was a, that was an iPod competitor. I'm talking about the thing where the the Walkman, where you actually have a CD <laughs> put in there, and if you take too large of a step, it skips. Like that's that's where we are. 
Yeah, that's where we are in crypto, in DeFi in particular. So it's still super mm -hmm. early. David, um, anything to add to that? Nothing. All right, man. Um, let's get to the last take, which is which is yours. So uh, maybe you should talk about this. Yeah. So so <laughs> I I put a lot of on my Instagram stories just of like Ethereum content just to tell all of my friends from college, friends from high school that like, hey, you should be paying attention to this Ethereum thing. So one of them mentions me, uh, hits me up in my DMs and goes, so why do you think ETH is going to 10K? And like I, I took a pause and I said, well, there's a number of reasons why. Like, what, what's what is the the best reason? You, you didn't want so, to bust out the triple point asset thesis. No, at this I didn't. I wasn't, over ready, DMs? I wasn't ready for the triple okay. point asset. He'll he'll get ready for that one. Um, <laughs> and so I, I my response to him was, well, there's lots of reasons. And I go, well, the main reason is memes, right? And memes will will take you know Ethereum to 10k, and already the 10k ETH is already a meme uh, formulated by our friend Anthony Cezano here, who, who you can actually see on the screen at the bottom. Um, but like, <laughs> memes are like digestible little nuggets of information, right? Um, triple point asset is one of those things. Uh, it's it's that's that one's a little bit hard to digest, but like memes and culture and just sharing memes and talking about like you know, um, all the little like snippets of information about how Ethereum is the thing that it is that helps people understand what it is in short little bits, um, I think is going to be the reason why Ethereum Ether goes to 10K. Ah, okay. So you were saying memes in general, and by that you meant narratives. You weren't saying specifically and only the, me the ETH to 10K meme, right? We'll no, take it to yeah. 10K. Although that's probably part of it. The more Definitely people who big, believe big in one. ETH to 10K, Mm -hmm. We'll socially coordinate around that number, get it to 10K. But you were talking about memes in general. And by memes, memes you meant like narratives to yeah, help yes. uh, mm -hmm. simple people understand complex mm -hmm. concepts like crypto. That's what's going to take. It, it, it's basically another way of, of saying what, what we say. I feel like almost every week that the most bullish thing for crypto mm -hmm. is to be understood. And memes help in that understanding. Not only do they help, they propagate it. Mm -hmm. Ryan, I think you saw that website that came out not too long ago and it was, I can't remember what the URL is, but it will be in the show notes. I know where it is in, in my DMs, but uh, you go to this website and it's a black screen and all you, you slowly see this 10K ETH slowly appear into into the website and it's got it's got this very like mysterious vibe around it and you start hearing the voice of eric connor talking about DeFi on the bull case for ethereum podcast that we did and then all every bullish sentence that eric connor ever said is like cut into this like very interesting website You're, you, you guys gotta watch it and then and then anthony Cesano cuts in and then dc investor cuts in all the bullish things and it's like the, the whole entire website is one big meme but like you can send that to someone and it's like hey there's the 10 10k ETH meme just like baked in there as this thing is like slowly making its way to the forefront of the website. And then you are listening to the voices of Eric Connor, Anthony Cezano, DC investor talking about all the bullish case cases for ETH. That whole website is a meme in my mind. That website is a meme, yet it's also conveying really good information. Yeah, it really is. This is how this is how internet culture propagates units of mm -hmm. information as well. And increasingly, mm -hmm. this is how people are investing, right? Just look at uh, GameStop. Just look at GME. Right. Just look at AMC. These are all community meme-driven investments as well. And crypto is definitely that. It's reflexive on the way up as well as the way down. Uh, David, those are our takes for the week. Now we've got to get to what you're excited about. What are you excited about this week? Yeah, so uh, last week I was excited about Loop Ring and I'm still excited about Loop Ring, but this week I'm excited about the concept or idea behind fiat on ramps into L2s. Uh, and so I think that it, we all we just talked about how much uh, Coinbase is spending on gas. A lot of what they're spending on gas is fulfilling customers' requests for withdrawals, right? Like you go to Coinbase, you have 10 ETH in your Coinbase account, you're 100 USDC or whatever, and you want to get that into your Ethereum wallet. So you hit the withdraw button and then Coinbase makes a transaction. That transaction costs them like $5 per user per transaction, right? So you and they pay that, you don't pay that. Uh, and maybe instead of sending money to people's on the L1, they could send to users' accounts on L2s. 
like Loopring, right? And so imagine this, right? You you take your, your fiat money from your bank account, send it to Coinbase, send, send it to Gemini, uh, buy ETH with it, trade it for ETH and have that ETH uh, or USDC. And you just get that uh, the, those assets sent to an L2 directly, right? And so the way that this would work is that Coinbase or Gemini, they would put, they would take one large sum of money, right? Uh, so a pool, they would put like, I don't know, half a million dollars into Loopring of, of ETH or USDC. And then they could give their, uh, users the option to withdraw directly onto Loopring um, for free. And, and, uh, and it would be free for them. So they're obviously incentivized. They're the ones, the, the companies, the exchanges are the ones saving that money. But if they withdraw to Loopring, they only have to take that like, you know, one million, half a million dollars worth of USD or stablecoin or Ether, put that on Loopring. And that's one transaction, right? So if 10, if like a hundred users all want to get onto Loopring, every single hundred user has to, every single user has to pay like $15. But if Gemini or Coinbase wants to get their assets onto Loopring, they also just pay $15 once, right? And so if they move a million dollars onto Loopring, then they can start paying out users' requests for withdrawals on Loopring using Ether or the, the supply of money that they put there. And they only paid one $15 transaction fee. And now that they can distribute those fiat or, or Ether settlements on Loopring, for free, right? Less gas base. And uh, many people who are trading on Coinbase like to trade on Coinbase or Gemini because they're centralized, which means they get instant trades. You know, uh, there's no gas fees. And that's what Loopring offers. Uh, and so I think the future of uh, fiat on ramps to L2s is ahead of us. Um, I th I'm, I'm excited for that to come. I'm, I want to see which uh, which of the major exchanges are going to integrate that first. But injecting cash straight into L2s, I think, is going to be really, really powerful, especially for people who just hate gas fees. Yeah, look, the first exchange that starts doing that gets our business automatically. So Tyler, Cameron, Winklevoss, if yeah. you guys are listening. We, we know you're Gemini. listening. <laughs> we know you listen to these. Uh, we want Gemini to build a fiat bridge directly to Ethereum layer two, directly to these layer twos. Look, they're still early, but you, you, you could do that right now with a loop ring for sure. Mm -hmm. And over the next six months, all the new layer twos that are stopping, starting up, I mean, that's where DeFi users can start their their crypto journey essentially right. they don't even have to go on high gas fee mainnet they can start directly in a layer two that's still secured and just as trustless as ethereum absolutely david that is the future and all we need is is kind of those fiat bridges so we'll see who builds them ryan what are you excited about all right uh i'm excited about a new crop of stable coins that i think is just starting to peek its head up and and just coming above the horizon so um, there's so many different, like, it's actually pretty easy to create a stable coin. Uh, you know, USDC is a stable coin that is backed by dollars in a bank account somewhere. That part's easy. What's, what's, what's really hard is making a trustless stable coin. And that's the difference because of course, with the USDC, who are you trusting? You're trusting the issuer, you're trusting the whitelist blacklist on USDC. Ultimately, you're trusting settlement in the traditional financial system in a traditional bank account somewhere. That's not bankless or it's kind of bankless, it's using crypto rails, but it's not really crypto natively, completely trustless, bankless, bearer instrument that ETH or Bitcoin it, uh, are. So what's the holy grail? The holy grail is to create a trustless stablecoin, something with the characteristics of Ether or Bitcoin, but also with some stability characteristics. And turns out that's really hard to do, but there are two ways you could do it. One, we had a conversation with Dan Elitzer, and this is the approach that many of these algorithmic uh, coins are taking is is you, you can basically back it by faith, back it by faith in the future demand of the algorithmic stablecoin. You kind of take a bet on that future demand. So empty set dollar, do I think that's going to increase in demand or decrease? If I think it's going to increase in demand and that demand will be sustained, well, there's a reasonable chance em empty set dollar might be able to hold its its uh, peg over the long run. So it's it's backed by faith, essentially, in the demand characteristics of empty set dollar. This is like the senior share sort of model. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. second way that you can do it is you can back it by ETH rather than faith. Mm -hmm. You can back it by a crypto money that people already have some faith in, that already has some value. So what I think we're going to see is this, this second type of uh, stable coin, basically an ETH-backed, purely ETH-backed, low governance uh, stable coin. So almost like a, a DAI before it was DAI, and it was just a, a single collateral DAI, but without the governance layer. 
And so we're seeing the advent of, of some of these. I think you, you talked to liquidity on uh, Meet the Nation, which is going to come liquidity. out on liquidity. liquidity. Okay, liquidity, Meet the Nation. Um, I'm looking forward to, to watching that and actually learning about that. So that's one. There's also Rye that's coming out. Um, I, I've been made aware of a, a few others. I think these are coming in the next six months. And these are basically stability stability coins, not quite pegged one-to-one -one with the dollar, though some are pretty close, that are all backed by trustless collateral ETH that don't have the uh, the, the messy human governance layer that a, a maker has. So I'm super excited because I think this is going to, there's going to be a massive wave of stablecoin innovation here. And I'm also excited because it's bullish for, for banklessness, right? You know, bare instruments, uh, stable coins that are completely trustless. And it's also quite frankly, it's bullish for ETH, you know, ETH mm -hmm. being the collateral uh, that, that backs all of these, these, this new wave of assets. So um, I'm excited about that, David. I just, um, it's going to be cool to see. I think it's coming in the next the next mm -hmm. couple of months and into the you know six to twelve month time horizon. I bet we'll see tons of these projects, and some of them will yeah. gain some traction. Yeah, the th and of course, the things that you get excited about also get me excited. <laughs> well, what I get excited about is some of these uh, trustless stable coins uh, have, have options to not use the dollar as the oh, reference yes. point. And, and so the, the conversation here, and this is kind of one of my, my early, uh, what, what really got me excited about MakerDAO in the early days is understanding that DAI is just a price feed, right? We just choose to peg to the dollar because that's what people want. If the dollar loses its dominance, all these stable coins don't have to point to the dollar anymore. Um, and so that's something to, to also consider in the, the very long term is that, you know, the dollar is temporary, yet some of these things have the ability to pivot, uh, unlike the dollar. The dollar can't pivot. The dollar is like grasping for straws if you, if you listen to Bitcoiners, which I, I tend to agree with. Um, the other thing that gets me excited about is each one of these stablecoin projects tinkers with incentives. So each one has their own incentive mechanisms, uh, yield incentivizations, uh, different ways to participate. And each one is going to tinker with all of them. They're going to be great for all of the DeFi power users that want to and really you know get what? their hands on them. At least one of them is going to get it right because everything that can be tried yeah. will be tried on, on Ethereum and in DeFi. So I, I've heard uh, this one before. Yeah, well, you know what? We, we, uh, we see these themes playing out everywhere. David, let's get to the meme of the week. What is the meme of the week this week? Yeah, the meme of the week this week is a, a bankless listener who, who has made a couple of, of memes about us lately. And so we, we, had to, we had to keep with the bankless themed content. But Jay-Z wearing a bankless shirt, doing the, the triangle sign. I don't even know what that's called. Uh, I don't really <laughs> listen to Jay-Z anymore. But he, what he's showing in this meme is the triple point asset, right? Doing, doing the triple points with the hand, store value on the top, commodity on the right, capital on the left. Uh, Jay-Z is woke to the triple point asset, folks. Oh my God, dude. Who, who is the biggest celebrity we can get in a bankless shirt? Uh, who would be your dream celebrity to get in a bankless well, shirt? It's Jay-Z. He's wearing one. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, right. we, that's already been done. Jay-Z. Yeah, this yeah, is that, real yeah. life. Okay. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know it was real. I didn't real. know it was a real picture. Okay. Yeah. That's no, awesome. Real real well, Jay-Z, I'm, I'm sure you're listening right now. Thanks for listening to Bankless. <laughs> and uh, thanks for believing the triple point asset thesis for yeah, us. That's a good thesis. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, risks and disclaimers. ETH is risky. Crypto is risky. So is DeFi. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you joined us on this Friday morning. This has been our weekly roll up.